This episode is brought to you by Merrill. Join one of the most iconic names in wealth management. Merrill, you'll be part of a dynamic team of advisors and specialists working hard every day to grow their clients' wealth. And with the support of best-in-class research, advanced digital tools, and the resources of a global institution, it's truly an opportunity you can be bullish about. Learn more at careers.bankofamerica.com. Copyright 2024. Bank of America Corporation. Max Bankman, I'm the new doctor. Welcome aboard the Odyssey. ABC Thursdays. This ship is heaven. We're tending to our passengers' dreams. I'm in. From 911 executive producer Ryan Murphy comes a splashy new drama on a luxury cruise ship with Joshua Jackson and Don Johnson. It's your job to keep everyone alive. She's in VFIT. One, two, three. Clear. I have a pulse. You're going to be okay. Dr. Odyssey, Thursdays, 9, 8 central on ABC and stream on Hulu. Well, good morning, guys, and welcome to the podcast. I've got a fantastic guest for you today from my hometown, Houston, Texas, uh, Jerry Fu, and he's actually in the medical industry, and he is a conflict resolution coach for Asian American leaders. I'm really excited to talk about this, particularly as ABC myself and the things we deal with in our culture and background, and happy to have him to fill in the gap. So, Jerry, welcome. Hi, Chris. Thanks for having me. Excited for our conversation. Yeah. Briefly introduce yourself and we'll dive right into the questions. Certainly. So yeah, I started off as a pharmacist and uh, worked for a chain for a little bit because my mom insisted that working for a chain pharmacy was a stability my dad never had, despite having two master's degrees, Uh, one in uh, chemical engineering and the second in computer science. And so after five years, I said, no more. And I took a teaching job through a pharmacy consulting company where I moved from Tennessee down to Houston for, and then I proceeded to get fired and then had lots of rough patches with my career between bounced paychecks, crooked bosses, crooked doctors. And then what I like to tell people is that leadership saved my career. I was invited to help facilitate some leadership material through a pharmacy leadership nonprofit. And that gave me the confidence to take on more management positions because I began to change my thinking about who I could become as a leader. And after a while, I said, you know what? I'm still sick of dealing with insurance claims and prescription drama. (laughs) I'm sure you can relate. And so I said, I want to focus on people development. So I said, I'm a, I want to be a coach, but I had no idea how to start to build a business. And it wasn't until I got formal coach training at Rice as the pandemic ramped up where I I realized I wanted to commit this dream in motion. So now I still straddle two fences, one as a pharmacy manager in the central Houston area and also building up my leadership coaching business in the process. So that's where things are. Yeah, that's a really fantastic segue. And one thing we really love is basically Asian Americans, professionals, or well-known in the science, STEM, or medicine, engineering, all these. Mm-hmm. The problem, really, I won't say problem, but you don't really see a lot of leaders, so, yeah. but we've got Jensen Wong and... Lisa Sue, but how do cultural in backgrounds influence? So why do you see not very many Asian American leaders talk about them? Yeah, part of the culture that we grow up in is a merit-based culture, right? Where we say work hard enough and someone who is important will notice you and then tap you on the shoulder and bring you up with the leadership, right? That is basically what we're told, earn your way into more income or more prestige. And you realize that doesn't work so well when you get to a country whose culture does not function the same way that as the one that we grew up in, right? So one of my examples I'll give is uh, there's an engineer from China who came over here, software engineer who worked for a big online retailer, and he just got frustrated because he goes, I came from a command and control family and a command and control work environment where I was in China. And now I come here and I see people who slack off that seem to get more opportunities than I do because they know how to, quote, sell themselves to upper management or look good in front of upper management. People take his credit. People take his opportunities. And so that's one reason not to point fingers, but it is a territory you have to learn how to navigate well. And that is one reason, right? Because number one, the culture teaches us you need a, a skilled and profitable profession with prestige, right? Become a physician, become a lawyer, become an engineer. And we realized that the person who's actually important is the one who signs the paychecks for those doctors as engineers and such, right? And so when you start to realize that the, the thinking you grew up with is no longer the thinking you need to actually be successful 
in leadership or management, that's when the opportunity for coaches like me to come in and help people make that transition. Yeah, it's so very well said. And some of the best advice I got growing up from my dad was he was like, learn to work smarter and versus harder. Like you can work yourself to death, but if people are, like you said, it's like this culture where it's political maneuvering and backstabbing and just you're able to navigate it, you can do better than just putting your head down and working hard. So one, one question is for mindset shifts, how can you shift this mindset from, how can Asian American professionals uh, shift this mindset from employees into entrepreneurship, leader, what kind of uh, mindset shifts do they need? Yeah, yeah. That's a very key question. One of the best tips for me was from a leadership book called It's Your Ship by Captain D. Michael Abershaw. One of the best tips in there that helped me was they challenged their readers to think like your boss. And what they mean by that is to say, what are my boss's needs? What is my boss dealing with? One of my challenges that where does this, how do I set my boss up for success in a way to make my boss look good? And so the interesting thing is when you start putting on the hypothetical hat and you start realizing, okay, this is the role I need to play to make sure my boss is set up for success. Then when your boss gets promoted, whether he takes you with him because he realized, Hey, this is a good teammate. I want him to come with me or if like he leaves his position vacated and they move you up, you realize, hey, you know what? I already know how to think like my boss. I'm already a bit more prepared than I realized because I started to anticipate needs and imagine what it took to get there beyond the, the, the standard job written description. So that was one of the best tips for me because when you start to expand your thinking, that's basically what unlocks possibilities. Yeah. The, in the fo- another follow-up question I have for you is, especially conflict resolution and kind of the stereotype is avoid conflict or just kind of, you know, uh, brush it under the rug. What are key strategies? Because I've had to develop this skill too, is like set boundaries, call people out. And uh, what are key strategies you teach for resolving conflicts effectively? Be firm, but be nice about it. How do you help clients in this area? Yeah. Incidentally, one of the, one of the funniest and most useful uh, phrases I heard from a, from an ink article was the style of the velvet fits to where it's like an iron fist wrapped in velvet. It's, it's, it's firm, but it's also soft on, on the edges. But uh, that kind of leads to the five-step framework I usually coach my clients through. Number one is to imagine what a successful conversation would sound like, right? And you have to define that success for yourself. Is it clear expectations? Is it a restoration of trust? Is it a truce or is it termination? You have to determine what your target is and to believe that is possible. The second is to recognize that the cost of doing nothing is more costly than the effort to try and fail. Uh, so the second step I tell people is 10 seconds of courage. 10 seconds of courage to set that boulder in motion, send that text, pick up that phone, send that email, and set that boulder in motion and lock the gate behind you so you can't backtrack or procrastinate or rationalize. And so that's a big step that people realize, hey, you know what? I need to stop letting myself off the, off the hook. The third is to script your critical phrases and to say, hey, you know what? Let me jot down the two or three main points that I know I need to make in this conversation. Let me anticipate what kind of pushback they're going to give me and then let me figure out how I can counter the counter. So best way you have an idea of how you need to improvise in case your plan doesn't stick the way you want it to. But the fourth step is to rehearse these critical phrases. So that way, get some reps in before you actually get into the game. You train at the dojo before you fight on the street. And that way, you're not tripping over your own words in the middle of the moment and your mind isn't going blank. And then this fifth step and final step is to follow through. Right. We want people to say, hey, you know what? I didn't do all this research just to feel good about myself. I did this to try to orchestrate a certain outcome. And so these are some things where people who are conflict diverse, or as I like to say, recovering and relapsing people leaders like myself, I like to say, you know what? Yeah. Failure doesn't mean you're done. Failure means you're not done. And I like to cite the example when I had the Victor roommate, right? If I said, hey, you have to move out. And it just says, make me. Me just sitting there saying, oh, does it fly that well? You have to go until he moves out. So that's one example I usually like to to share and remind people of to say, hey, you know what? Yeah, you're not done as long as the result isn't there. And one thing that I really loved about your comment is this idea of people pleasing. And and it's again, it's very prevalent in, in our culture. And so how do you deal with this? And then I also wanted to, because you mentioned a really beautiful step framework of how to 
resolve conflicts. And the underlying feelings is like people pleasing, guilt, and shame. How do you get over this fear? Like when you're going to speak to somebody and be like, hey, don't, don't do that or put up a boundary or call someone out, or sometimes you have to step in and mediate a conflict. How do you deal with these three uh, core issues? Mm, yeah, I think when, yeah, in this culture that says, oh, don't rock the boat, don't upset people, don't antagonize people, you realize you, know, you have to strip all that away. And what I mean by that, to do that, you just have to say, you know what, we have to define the problem. And the problem is not the person, the problem is the problem, right? And so then you're able, you have to initiate that initial confrontation, say, hey, we're both a part of this and I'm going to need your help and I need a conversation around this. Because one of the tough truths that you and I probably have realized is that politeness doesn't solve the problem. Assuming people know what you're thinking also doesn't solve the trouble. And so being polite and hoping they figure out what you intend for them to do in high context cultures like ours, which where we have to play a lot of cultural games to, to pass a test that we don't find out we failed until later, right? Oh, I forgot to take my shoes off during uh, our dinner and now I'm not being called, but I'm not being invited back to dinner again, right? Because they quiet quit us, things like this. And so you re because to take a business example, right? Like I'll do this Intel used to be in all the memory chips. And the CEO knew that at the time knew, hey, we've got microprocessors lined up. IBM wants to buy all these microprocessors from us. And so even though the memory chip business, they were losing market share, it was still profitable. And so all these former employee or current employees that were with the company a while had that identity and revenue stream wrapped up with memory chips. And he had to ask himself, if I got fired and they brought in a replacement, what would he do? And his, he realized his replacement would not have that emotional attachment to a, a profitable but dying market stream. And so he realized we're going we're gonna to have to commit to this new one. And thankfully, he said, why can't I just do that myself? And so thankfully for him and the company, he made that commitment. And now Intel is still king of that hill. Unlike Continental, which tried the straddle two fences when they tried to copy Southwest's flight revenue model of like smaller airports and, and one track planes. When they tried the straddle two fences, the company went bankrupt. And the conflicts that we see here, they're necessary because these are productive conflicts because if you don't address them, your company will die by default. And so this is where you realize, hey, conflict this is something to avoid. Conflict is something that actually reveals truth about a, about difficult situations. And the sooner we recognize the difficult truth, the sooner we can do something about it. As you've seen it, right? No one would say, oh, the cancer diagnosis is too harsh and it's very discouraging. Let's just not tell them anything. But no, that, then the patient dies, right? So yeah, just to throw in a health example because we're both in healthcare. But yeah, that's my answer. You get your eyes quickly. The sooner you deal with the difficult, the sooner you can actually come up with solutions because you're confident enough to say, hey, you know what? With my toolbox and with the help of my team, Let's try to actually do something productive about it. And the follow-up question is, when people come to you for coaching or advice, what do they most commonly come to you for? Is it that they can't progress or like they just, they can't keep a job just because they can't navigate the politics of the, the company? Is it they want to become leaders or entrepreneurs? Like kind of talk about, I'm just trying to get a pulse of what people are coming to you for. Absolutely. One of the best certifications they got is in designing your life out of Stanford, where they talk about career and life design. And so part of designing your career is knowing how to network well and to bring up the sensitive topics without antagonizing the person you're with, right? So I'll give a quick example. Let's say someone is wanting a raise or a promotion. If they just say, hey, boss, I want a raise. Can I have one? The directness is appreciated. The honesty is refreshing. And yet he's probably going to dig his heels in and probably give you the war, the runaround and say, not at right now. But if he phrased it as a hypothetical where he said, hey, boss, how does someone like me get a raise at a company like this? Right now, it's it's a different feel, right? Because even if the boss is thinking, oh, this guy's just trying to get a raise, but you're not asking for a raise, you're asking for advice, right? And so that's a nice that's a much more diplomatic way of bringing up the same topic without putting anyone on their heels or anything in an awkward situation. So whether it is, hey, boss, how does someone like me get a promotion at a company like this? Sounds a lot better than, hey, boss, I think I'm being underappreciated or overworked here. I think you should move me up, right? Maybe that works. Maybe you're going to have a strong enough relationship with your boss to do that, but more than likely you don't. 
And even then, that's not a dynamic you want to antagonize because your boss is a very really uh, important relationship that you want to don't treat like fine china. You're afraid to break things, but you also don't want to punch it too hard either. And so other things people will ask for advice on is, hey, do I reframe and re-enlist where I am and just look at my current situation with fresh eyes? Do I have that discussion with my boss about redesigning my current responsibilities to focus more on what I love doing for the company and less of what just taxes my time? Do I have to relocate within the same company to say, hey, I want a different set of challenges and leverage my current warm network to get there? Or do I finally say, okay, I have to reinvent myself by going to grad school or starting my own business or making something different? So these are all very common questions when people ask me for career advice. It's less about me making recommendations for them as opposed to giving them a framework so they can come up with their own solution. And that's not including the interview questions that people want me to coach them through so that they iron out their phrasing and that they're able to articulate their thoughts articulate uh, accurately and, and tactfully. So those are a lot of the things that people ask for my help around. Yeah, I know we have uh, around five minutes remaining. And the question I have for you is, especially if you look at the corporate landscape of leadership, it's, it's not very diverse or representative. And what trends or changes do you anticipate for diverse communities? And so my, like my, our overarching question is, because if I look at emerging con countries such as uh, China and India, and they're coming out with Alibaba or Baidu, Tencent, these really fabulous companies. Mm -hmm. And then you look at Western companies and it's like this white male or older white male and it's very, very aggressive. We have to outspoken. How do Asians become leaders in the, these type of paradigms? Because I see, is it this, you know, there's a really great book called Quiet. Is it because some you know, criticisms are quiet, soft-spoken, not assertive. Uh, how do you, they navigate this if they want to become leaders? Yeah, that's a great question. Part of it is... I think recognizing that introversion is not a deal breaker for leaders. Some of the most effective leaders are actually introverts. So that's a, that's another side conversation. But part of it is for anyone who aspires to be a leader, first, you have to ask yourself, what is this company culture? How do they treat leadership? The, revisiting the engineer that I mentioned previously, I asked him because he wanted to move up into leadership and I asked him, do you like who you're going to become? in order to act like one of the boys. And he realized very quickly that was not the case. He knew he could have to adapt his style so that at work he would have to take on a certain persona. It's not to compromise his identity, it's just the kind of person he needs to be while at work. We don't want to go into the whole, oh, I have to wear masks for me, you know, friends and one for my boss. That's not what we're advocating. What we are saying is, who do you have to be? And so if you go to a company like Alibaba and you look at their culture, and we always like to ask yourself, do you like who your leaders are becoming? We always say, they say, I want a promotion. I said, do you like what your boss does? Do you like the fact that he's overworked and <laughs> hitting things like this? And they realize, you know what, well, maybe I don't want to have that promotion. Maybe there's some, they, they just some more other things. But my initial advice and recommendations would be, hey, study the culture first, because if you don't think this is a healthy culture where they actually support and equip and develop leaders well, then that's not a company you probably want to be at long term. It is something you're going to want to make the most of your opportunities there. Adapt what you like, adopt what you like, and make sure you, you leave behind what you don't. But yeah, the first thing is just to say, what would I want in a company culture that I believe is conducive to developing uh, confident and capable leaders? And then just having that rubric in mind to compare what your company actually does. Uh, and that way you can make a decision to either have the conversations, make some adjustments with them, or you may have to hop to another company through the new expect. But that's a simple answer for a very complicated situation. I find them very fascinating because, for example, like in STEM or Silicon Valley, some of the most valuable companies are very heavily Asian dominated and okay. it's like China and just, and then just very, so I'm just curious how people listening to this, they're Asian and they want to progress and how should they adopt their leadership style. Mention, mention there was one really great resource you mentioned in the book and what other resources and how can people find you and reach out to you and follow you and contact you? Oh, thank you. Yeah, I have a book list. That client actually said I should try to sell it because he didn't like the, the list so much. And <laughs> I was flattered because he didn't pay for it either. <laughs> I don't know how I'm supposed to sell it when you even like 
my best, my best advocate is still not paying for it. That's a whole other conversation. Uh, yeah. So I mentioned Insear Ship by Captain uh, D. Michael Abershoff. That's a great one. Other great books include The Leadership Challenge by Kuzis and Posner. That's a very comprehensive book. The other resources are John Maxwell's The 21 if Irrefutable Laws of Leadership. If you want to start, I'd, I'd recommend those three books there. The framework I mentioned in this conversation, you can download for free off my website, adaptingleaders.com forward slash guide. Uh, you can check out the free blog. You can book a complimentary 30 minute call or download the guide there. And then you can also connect with me on LinkedIn, uh, whether you do well, one, two or three, uh, yeah, find me and I'll be happy to, to uh, provide some support. Yeah. Really great conversation. I really enjoyed this and hit an emotional home for me as well. I think a lot of people resonate and they can understand what, and thank you for your time and your expertise and I keep up the great work. Thanks. I hope this pays dividends for you and your listeners.